Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we run up 66 flights of stairs while bleeding profusely from our chest wound. Because this week we watched Escape to L.A. Written by Jim Gray and John Chabon. Directed by Billy Gerhardt. And aired on July 29th, 2011. You know, going into this episode, I was really wondering, like, what is the torture team actually escaping when they're escaping to L.A.? Because it kind of seems like they're just actually pursuing their leads and going to L.A. and not escaping from anything in, I don't know, I guess they were in Virginia before this? D.C., so technically its own, uh, like, entity, but yeah, Virginia slash Maryland. Yeah, so what are they actually escaping? I mean, it's not like they're running away from... They don't even know who they're up against yet until this episode. <laughs> and they even still. The, they know the CIA is out to get them, so maybe they're escaping from the CIA. Yeah, I guess. But it's not like the CIA like just doesn't operate in, in LA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the CIA, what, operates everywhere in the US, but LA is, oh no. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're riffing on, obviously they're riffing on John Carpentier carpenter here with the uh, title and i've never watched escape from la but i have watched escape from new york and the present mm-hmm. the, the premise of that movie and yeah maybe the presence of it as well uh, what gives it its presence <laughs> is like the premise is that new york has just been turned into this um this lawless like prison ground thing and the whole premise is that like these terrorists airdrop the president into new york <laughs> And they have to send in uh, Snake Plissken, right? This sort, of, this this guy who's on death row to save him. Wow, that sounds terrible. It was good. I, I liked it. I, I watched it uh, maybe a couple years ago for the first time. I mean, I'm sure the I'm sure the movie could be pretty good. It's just seeing the premise is kind of um uh huh interesting. I actually just realized that actually yes. The CIA doesn't operate in L.A. because we talked about this. The CIA is international and the FBI is domestic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Wow. How could we have forgotten? So, yeah, I guess maybe they are escaping the CIA. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't work. Maybe they're also escaped. I guess we don't really know who the hitman guy was, but like, yeah, they don't escape him. They actually lead him to where they are because of what Esther does at the opening of the episode. Right, which is that she basically uh, goes to visit her sister, who we haven't met yet, but last episode in Dead of uh, Not, she basically mentioned that her sister has difficulty coping with just life before the miracle even happened. Right. We don't ever really find out what this is all about, or or we haven't found out yet, I should say. But at the beginning of the episode, Esther visits her sister's place, or and her place, because she lives with her sister. And it's pretty clear that she, her sister has some sort of mental... Uh, Ill, mental uh, problems Difficulties? going on. Yeah. And it's not clear what, but she's like, she's boarded up the house. She's not letting Esther come in. She's written like no visitors, no guests, nobody in on uh, on the boards. Mm-hmm. And she's she's there with her children, and she won't let Esther see them. So Esther's nieces and nephews. Mm-hmm. So Esther thinks this is safe. For what reason I don't know. <laughs> she, she, we know she's not experienced in the field, like. Rex, Gwen, and Jack are. But she basically then, after seeing the state that her sister is in, uh, makes a, quote, anonymous, unquote, call to Child Protective Services. Right. Which, you know, as you can see coming, maybe not as you can see coming, because I actually thought that this wasn't... I didn't think... While while I was in the scene, I was like, all right, she's, she's just there for like two minutes, whatever. Like, it's going to be fine. No one's ever going to know. But no, there is just like this hitman. 
Uh, yeah, smash right that there. to the guy in the car across the street. Like, I found her. <laughs> yeah, I've located Esther, uh, whatever her last name is. <laughs> Drummond. Drummond, right. So she this, is ultimately their undoing by the end of this. Yeah, yeah, because this guy gets instructions to follow Esther back to Jack and then basically uh, take out Jack and do whatever he wants with the rest of them. Right. Where the episode goes here, though, is really where Miracle Day shows its hand almost and is is <laughs> where it differentiates itself a bit from Children of Earth um, even further because it's like, this is dealing, this is, I mean, it's not like the earlier seasons of Torchwood where it was more episodic. It is this sort of serialized, ongoing story. Yet, unlike Children of Earth, it's not just this back-to-back thing, right? There's there's time and the, the character, you know, there's there's a space between each episode. Because mm-hmm. next we see of, you know, our four main characters, they're in L.A., so obviously some time has, has passed. They've stolen cars cross-country and made it all the way from sea to shining sea, you might say, fulfilling their manifest destiny, you might say... <laughs> Right. <laughs> I don't know why I'm going that route with it, but hey. Look, I admire that you uh, you just basically full center. You started down that path, and then you just you just were like, "I'm gonna finish this if it can, even if it doesn't land." So you know, good on you. Yeah, like when you just keep telling a joke, no matter how unfunny, you know it is. Like we mentioned, what a week or two ago. Yeah, but this is actually nice because Doctor Who and Doctor Who adjacent, as I like to call it, has never really brought us close to home. And by us, I mean literally us, us <laughs> two. Never really brought us close to home, aka Southern California. The one and only. <laughs> Can you imagine if there are two Southern Californias, that would be terrible. <laughs> I mean, there are different, like, biomes, right? It's like you have the more coastal, like, metropolitan regions, and then you have sort of the inland, you have the desert, and then you have Orange County, obviously, which is just its own weird beast, and then L.A., which is its own weird beast, and then San Diego, which yeah, I guess is... It's its own weird beast? Yeah. Hmm, I'm noticing a pattern here. This episode takes place in not a weird beast, but a weird beach. Venice Beach. (laughs) Yeah, so Venice Beach is basically like the most famous beach in Los Angeles County, uh, I think. At least outside of, like, the U.S., I want to say. I can't think of any, any beach or, like, area of L.A. named beach that's more famous than Venice Beach. I think Venice Beach is the one that's gotten the most screen time in movies, which is why it's the most famous. But, I mean, there are tons of beaches in L.A. There's Manhattan Beach. There's Hermosa Beach. There's Redondo Beach. There's Huntington Beach. Long Beach. So there's lots of beaches in L.A., I guess, is my point. Is long, Well, yeah. I guess that's Long Beach is in L.A. County, huh? Was, yeah. yeah. I think Huntington, of all the ones I named, is the one that's – that's most on the border between LA and Orange County. Yeah, I don't know exactly where the border lies, but I always, yeah, that's always because then below Huntington it's Newport, and then it's Laguna. Yeah, with Corona Del Mar in the middle there somewhere. <laughs> well, it was nice to see, you know, uh, cityscapes that sort of uh, don't look familiar because I mean I don't live in LA, but like that look, you know, more familiar, I guess. Right, yeah, they look, uh, yeah, they have, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I was gonna try say the same thing in a different way, but there's no better way to say it than that, so. Yeah, you could really see with all the, uh, you know, trash just around, I guess, and, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, this is the this is the one uh, complaint I have about like every movie ever that portrays L.A., including this. It just portrays L.A. as this like great place to go, this beautiful city with like clean streets and like great people and like beautiful beaches. But let me just hit you with some knowledge here. As someone who's been to L.A., L.A. is nothing like that. L.A. is a hellhole <laughs> of like just trash, refuse, and just like 
it, it, it never looks as good as it does in the movies. Just trust me on this, <laughs> including the beaches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's good parts to LA. It's like there's there's good aspects of everything, almost. <laughs> yeah. Almost. <laughs> so, Gwen begs Jack not to like stay in, I guess, the seedy part of LA. So they find a building house apartment for rent yeah no somewhat close to the beach like right there actually yeah. gotta imagine gotta imagine how expensive that is like if you i mean if you live on a beachfront in la like you're a millionaire like no <laughs> like that just... it, where is jack getting the money for all of this <laughs> like Jack's the one who pays for this 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 room building. Right. Thing. He hands the guy a wad of cash. It's basically like this more if you tomorrow if you don't tell anyone we're here. Yeah, and this is I mean, he's just handing this guy like millions upon millions per day to to stay here probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the house looks way run down, so maybe that's why he's getting a good deal <laughs> <Yeah>. on it. <laughs> like so they and then they just like dump hundreds of thousands of dollars I have to imagine on like a server <laughs> that they have shipped to that address so so much for I don't know keeping your head down <laughs> just shipping a like enterprise level computer server to this beachfront property like if anybody at the FBI or CIA in this universe is even like one tenth of of competent at their job they would notice that this is weird <laughs> well they're really not doing much to hide their presence in any way because a few things happen here at the beginning so Gwen is sort of walking along the beach and she calls Reese just straight up calls him and I, I remember Esther saying something about bouncing the signals off of um, different satellites or whatever but still mm -hmm. I mean she just blatantly calls Reese and catches up with him Rex blatantly calls Vera and catches up with her and asks her if she knows where he can get some drugs in LA yeah honestly like Rex spends the rest of the episode chewing everyone out for like calling people or giving away the number and I'm like Rex you were literally on the phone <laughs> yeah. with Vera when this episode started like <laughs> What Contact that can easily trace you back to all the things you've been doing for the past three weeks. <laughs> Someone who's known your every movement for <laughs> weeks. And as all this is going on, we're introduced to yet another new plot point. The whole dead is dead thing. Yeah, but that seems something that's less recurring and more in this episode for... True, true. I don't, yeah, like boosting up Oswald Danes' uh, influence and power, true. I suppose. There's this politician, Ellis Hartley Monroe, who Dead is Dead is her sort of slogan, and you see it plastered on the walls everywhere, and you see it on the news, and sh her, uh, her whole shtick is that the people who should have died should be considered dead. Yeah, they should be treated like they actually are dead. And, you know, just like the fact that people are, are agreeing with this is, is <laughs> concerning and yet not all that surprising. No, it's it's just it's one of those other things that, yeah, it, it is very concerning. And it's one of those things that like you think, oh, if I was in these people's shoes, I wouldn't be one of those people. And maybe you wouldn't be, but still it's like it's just like the uh, Oswald Danes being held up as like this hero and this awesome person when he when his claim to fame like we mentioned before was him killing and raping a 12 year old like it's one of those things mm -hmm. that you go oh my god but then you know it's it's when you think about it it's more probably plausible than you might at first think yeah speaking of oswald danes he is actually watching this sort of news report from from monroe when he and and as is kitzinger they're sort of there in this hotel room watching it together Another really yeah. uncomfortable scene because he insinuates that he spent the last like night looking up child pornography. I don't know if you got that, but that's what I got out of his comments here. Oh, I honestly wasn't even paying attention to this scene. 
He so he was talking about how he. Uh, what was it he uncovered oh he says he wasn't allowed on the internet for a long time i know i remember that yeah and he also says that he's someone who who understands a lot about hiding his presence on the internet oh yes 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 because he he also does investigate he was trying to investigate fi court right and he the the he the the more trails he followed and the more you know i guess breadcrumbs that he found the more out of his grasp everything seemed. So, Yeah, so he's a little suspicious of FICOR, but he's going along with Jilly's plan for, why not, for, I guess. For world domination. <laughs> or at least a ton of money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he does, like, chew Jilly out. I think now he's like, she's got, because he's about to go to his interview at Central News, I think it is, and Jilly's like, ah, they canceled because they actually want uh, Monroe. Ellis Hartley Monroe. And he's like, what do I pay you for? Like, go do your job. Right. So he threatens her as well. I mean, obviously. Yeah, they're, they're a little miffed that Monroe is doing better than them in the TV ratings and just in popularity and in the public consciousness in general. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Vera is, well, Vera's being pitched a very questionable idea, basically. Right, she and the other doctors from the conference that we've been seeing these past couple episodes get into what looks to be a, an emptied out or abandoned hospital. And the woman who's in charge of this essentially tells them that they're going to use this as... I don't think they introduced the um, the camp term at this point, but um, what was the actual... What did they call it? Um, plague ship. Well, one of the doctors refers to it as a plague ship. A plague ship, but they, had, they called it something camp. Just goes to show you how campy this all is. <laughs> oh, I don't have no. the term written down in my notes. Um, overflow camp, that's what it was. Mm. So essentially what, I don't, is overflow camp a real term now that I think of it? I'm just going to Google it right now. Overflow. To the internet. Camp. No. No, yeah. Well, <laughs> TARDIS. The second, the second result is TARDIS stuff. Right. Com for me. Right, right. So essentially what this is, is they're going to be housing all the people who were supposed to have died in these hospitals termed overflow camps and taking care of them there, I guess, in quotes, taking care of them in quotes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the doctor who's pitching this, like, to, to reuse this abandoned hospital is justifying it by saying instead of having 20 hospitals across the whole city that are over, that are over capacity, we'll just have this one. Mm -hmm. uh, this plan immediately goes to shit. Uh <laughs> Because they never like, they never institute any sort of plan about the plan before initiating the plan. So just all the hospitals start sending their overflow people here like immediately at the same time, and they they have nobody to actually staff the hospital at all. They don't turn on the electricity. They're just basically screwed. And you get the you get the um, impression that like because this is Monroe's sort of um, platform, I guess or at least it's something mm -hmm. that she is advocating for. So you get the impression that like the there there's there's this sort of I don't know how to explain it. There's this sort of disconnect between like obviously the people like Monroe who are the politicians who are making these decisions and then when you're actually on the ground it's like another one of those things that rings a little different in 2021 where it's like you're on the ground and this is just not what it was supposed to be <laughs> at all. But unsurprisingly She, I mean, she definitely, I mean, I don't think she was involved in approving the project, but she's definitely taking advantage of this, uh, this turn of events for her own gain. Definitely. As we see later with the whole really uncomfortable, again, scene with Oswald, but we'll get there. Yeah, because meanwhile, on the other coast, the group 
is trying to find a way into uh, into FICOR's headquarters, which are in L.A., which is why they actually came to L.A. It's not just to escape the CIA. It was a convenient place to go because the HQ is there. Right. I think at this point, Rex meets with his dads, which is which his, his dad, not dad's plural. Which is, his dad's. Um, which is, it's not a major part of the episode, but I assume it's going to come into play uh, further on. I would be surprised if this was the only thing, you know, with his dad, right? Yeah, yeah. And we kind of get a preview of this before it happens because, um, shoot, I've totally blanked on her name now. Esther? Esther, <laughs> geez, thanks. Esther mentions, like, didn't, didn't you have family in L.A., Rex? And he's like, no. No, uh, no, don't want to talk about it. No, she's like, but I, but I'm pretty sure when I was like doing a profile on you, that like I saw that, you, and he's like, nope, nope, nope. Yeah, that should have been a big red flag that that was foreshadowing, <laughs> but I didn't get that whatsoever. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, his dad is living this sort of destitute uh, life existence in, yeah. in a motel, probably. Or it looks like a motel. And he confronts him, but his dad pulls this shotgun on him, and they obviously don't have a great history with one another. Rex says, like, his dad doesn't have to live like this. Right, and we don't really learn... Again, it's it's similar to what we see with Esther. We don't really learn what that means. Yeah, I just assumed it meant, like, Rex gets good enough money to support both of them. But they're like too estranged from each other to to do that or right. something like that. Right. And in that sense, it, that aligns with Rex being the one to reach out to his dad, you know, to confront him. Mm-hmm. Because maybe his dad has more of a problem with him than he has with his dad. Although they both, they both obviously have problems with each other, as you can see from the scene. His dad kind of seems to be a little uh, conspiratorial. A little anti-government, actually, I think. Yeah. He also, just like, um, what was her name? Was like Liz or something? The woman on the airplane? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah just Lynn. like her. Lynn. Just like Lynn, he blatantly lies when the truth is, like, very easily discernible. Because he's like, that's, that, it's not even loaded. Like, And Rex is like, oh, really? He just takes the gun and <laughs> sees that it is loaded. <laughs> And then he says, so what if it is? <laughs> yeah, just not even trying. <laughs> like father, like son. Wow, wow. You know, you try running up 66 flights of stairs, bleeding out. Well, if I'm immortal, then damn, it probably wouldn't even be that hard. <laughs> wow. Get your, get, get your stuff together, Rex. Get it together. I don't know why I'm going so hard on Rex on this episode. No, Rex is growing on me, to be perfectly honest. He's not, you know, he's not a great guy. He's still, still not a great guy, but he's growing on me. But who in Torchwood is a great guy? Who, who, who in Torchwood is? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Yanto is probably, well, I want to, no. I, well, I, I as we say. found out, he like lied about his entire family history. Yeah, and was harboring uh, his cyberized girlfriend in the basement. Yeah. Telling anyone. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Who is the most innocent character on Torchwood? Main character, not just like, oh, that random, you know, passerby Gosh. extra in that one. No, probably Reese. Probably Reese. Uh, I mean, okay, I guess if we're considering Reese a main character, then then I would say PC Andy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we've completely blown past my Amazon X-Ray Fun Fact of the Week that reminds me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Candace Brown, who plays Esther's sister, apparently, this is, again, this is mind-blowing. Just, I was so shocked when I read this, was a cheerleader with Eva Mendes. Who is that? Ooh. Who who's Eva Mendes? <laughs> Some actress. Oh. Really, really famous actress. 
<laughs> Although I guess not that famous. I've never heard of her. I don't she know. She was in Too Fast, Too Furious. Oh, I don't know actors though, so I could, I could, I could very easily have said that to like a famous actor. But yeah, whatever. she, she, I mean, she was pretty famous in the in the in the early aughts and uh, late nineties. She's apparently in a relationship with Ryan Gosling. Didn't realize that. Yeah. Huh. Anyway, yeah, that that's the Amazon X Ray Fun Pack of the Week. <laughs> so yeah, they devised this plan then to infiltrate FICOR. And it's it's multi layered and it has these different components to it, which are fun to watch play out, I think. If a little weird, I want to talk about the Nicholas Frumpkin stuff at the end, because there's some there's <laughs> weird stuff with that. There's weird parts about that. <laughs> Their plan basically is to Ocean's Eleven their way in. They Ocean's Four. <laughs> yeah, okay, Ocean's Four. <laughs> Harkness is Four. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Cooper's Four, maybe, if you want to put Gwen in charge. Well, yeah. But yeah, anyway, continue. <laughs> FICOR has a server in their office building that they need the information off of. So what they plan to do is get this duplicate server, as we mentioned before, uh, destroy it, and replace it with the server that they need, so that when FICOR finds out that the server's been tampered with, they just think it's destroyed rather than stolen, and they don't worry about anything other than the lost data. Yeah, not a terrible plan. It's just, I'll say that, it's not a terrible plan. Yeah, I mean, what else would you do? Go in guns blazing? Guess you could, since death doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, why not? <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> but to do that, <laughs> they need to get by some security measures, including some biometrics from this guy named Nicholas Frumpkin. Which sounds yeah, like what a, a name. I know, he sounds like he's from an old like fairy tale or something. <laughs> or from, a, like, he sounds like he'd be the main character of a limerick. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> it's true and that's why I actually wanted to talk about him which I, we can touch on more at the end because when you actually see him he's he's Asian or of, of Asian yeah. descent mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah I mean he's uh yeah I don't know if that says anything particularly interesting about the character, necessarily. No, I don't either. I just thought it was... Although, I mean, since we're already on the topic, I don't know. I just thought it was odd that they gave him that name. I don't know. I don't, I I don't know. I think it was just a weird attempt at humor. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> like Frumpkin. Like... I don't know, Frumpkin. It, yeah, but it also, it was just weird to me because, this, you know, he's obviously, uh, I don't know the guy who played him, but he's obviously an Asian American actor. Um, let me look up here. Kelvin Yu is the guy who played him. I don't know who that is. I don't think he's all that well known or famous, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, it was just weird to me because especially when they confront him to get his biometric data Jack goes like, oh, yeah, your name was Nicholas Jackson, right? And it's just, I don't know, it's just weird that, like, to me, it's weird that, like, this character who obviously is Asian, they're, you know, portraying as having this name that, like, probably an Asian-American guy would, like, not have, you know? Maybe, yeah, sure. Maybe there's something to it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have anything else to say other than that. I just thought it was really weird. Mm-hmm. That, you know, he's, yeah, just basically exactly what I said. He's this Asian American guy, yet they gave him this name that, like, an Asian American guy would, like, most likely not have Nicholas Frumpkin. <laughs> Maybe it's to throw you off the trail. <laughs> of what? Of... I don't know. I don't know. If... <laughs> of Nicholas Frumpkin. <laughs> Anyway, they need his fingerprint and, like, an eye scan from him, which they get by pretending to be, like, I don't know what they were pretending to be. (laughs) 
just a, dumb, just a newly married couple. Just, yeah, I think. just a dumb like newly married couple. Who like the first like sign that something's wrong is like they're like they confront Nicholas and he's pushing a stroller with his you know child and he's walking with his wife and like or girlfriend or whatever and like they're like oh yeah just you know ours is the same age and they show them this they show them this picture of a baby and it's like okay well if you have this child like where the hell is it like <laughs> you know if you're if you're if you're pretending to be this you know couple who has this child why is the child like conspicuously not there <laughs> look i mean by the time that they get to the point where gwen and jack are showing them a picture i think they're just like they just want to get <laughs> yeah, out of it that's true <laughs> so that question like even if it is in their mind i can't imagine it's what they're uh, most concerned with the yeah moment. it's true basically they take frumpkins they take a recording of his voice from while well, speaking to him they get a, an eye scan from showing him the picture of the kid and they get his fingerprints by asking him to hold their water mm. bottle. A lot more subtle than uh, <laughs> than the method that the gentleman takes later. Right. As soon as this is all over, I think there's a little bit in between this, but Nicholas gets into his car at one point and the hitman just leans forward from the back seat, puts a knife to his throat, it gets his voice via the recording that he's taking and then says, no mm -hmm. one has to die. All I need is your hand and an eye. So obviously he, he loses a hand and an eye. Yeah, but thanks to the immortality, he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, fine, in, in quotes. <laughs> he'll be fine. It's fine. It's just a flesh wound. Heavy air quotes. <laughs> As opposed to, to light exactly. air quotes. So Gwen, Jack, and the gang enact their plan simultaneously across the U.S. Uh, while Ellis Hartley Monroe is giving her talk in front of the hospital. Oswald Danes looks on with disdain <laughs> from a car oh, wow. nearby. Dis oh, and, my God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and eventually decides to take matters into his own hands and uh, puts on a mask and heads into the hospital. Yeah, I mean, at least he's being considerate about the whole mask thing, you know, so. Yeah, I guess. Doesn't want to spread cholera from Boston. This cholera in Boston thing, they're making a big deal about this in this show. <laughs> cholera Didn't in Boston. Didn't they only mention it once? Well, this is the second episode in a row they've mentioned uh, it now. Yeah, I gotcha. Because they mentioned it in this episode too. Yeah. Oswald goes into the hospital that we saw Vera at, or the, the same floor, or the same room, or whatever, and he tells the people inside that he's just like them, and he knows they deserve better because he, too, survived death. Yeah. Let, let us not skip over the scene where some mom just, like, dumps her child at the hospital because she doesn't want to take care of him anymore. Yeah, I mean... Now that everyone's We in glossed order. over it, but the scene where Vera sees what's going on and is just disgusted by it is is pretty you know it, it's pretty impactful i'd say because you see there's just like this tr there's just this child that's been dumped there people are obviously not getting the medical attention they need everything is grimy and dirty and dusty and yeah there's just like vomit on pillows and just junk everywhere nobody's being taken care of and that's basically what it is and basically what Od oswald walks into like a madman. <laughs> madman with a death wish, perhaps. But this gets a lot of media attention. Right in the middle of Monroe's interview, the reporters go like, hey, it's Oswald Danes, and like try and run in after him. Oh my god, it's Oswald. <laughs> it, Marry me, Oswald. Marry it's me. TV's Oswald Danes. <laughs> It's Central News's Oswald Danes. Kitzinger is obviously really happy about this because Oswald is now making bank again. He's back on top, boys. He's back on top. She tells him earlier in the episode that he has to come up with a snappy slogan like Dead is Dead that uh, Monroe has. And, and his snappy slogan is a like, 
don't copy my homework. Okay, I'll change it so no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> alive is alive. Yeah. <laughs> Just change it up a little so the teacher doesn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> As all this is going on, Esther is being asked if everything is online because Gwen is about to infiltrate, and she says yes, despite the blatant screens that say offline. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that, but it is, it's just this funny moment where she's like, yep, no, and then all it. the screens in front of her, like all three of them say offline. <laughs> Another one of Esther's screw-ups. Damn, Esther, really, get with the program here. Wow, maybe it should be Seven Deadly Sins of Esther. Yeah, you know, maybe she should have thought twice before she tried to take care of her obviously ailing sister and her children. Like, who does Re that? Replace Tasha's tech corner with Esther's tech failure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why we're so mean to all the Torchwood characters. We were never like this on Doctor Who. Like, we just railed into Owen for being the, for just everything that he is. We make fun of Gwen constantly, even though, for more than we probably should, even though she's not perfect. Jack, we talk about how, <laughs> how everything just tears him apart. Yet he doesn't show it, which is like we make and we we come at that from a humorous angle. Yet, really, that does it like a person like that deserves, you know, care and attention <laughs> type thing. <laughs> God, we talked, we went on at length about how Ihanto was a nobody. <laughs> That's not as egregious as the other ones. Okay, hold up. That one, no, no, no. I, I think that one was fine. <clears throat> oh, yeah, just ignoring someone, ghosting them IRL? Sure, yeah. Look, Torchwood turned us into terrible people, too. <laughs> yeah, that's the true takeaway from Torchwood, is just as Gwen becomes this person that she doesn't recognize... So do you, as the viewer. <laughs> Torchwood does something to you, and it's not good. Dunzo. <laughs> That's all I had to say. <laughs> the only response I have is, well, shoot. <laughs> too, too late now? We've watched, what, 40 episodes of this? <laughs> 35? Yeah, we're pretty deep. We're pretty deep into Torchwood at this point. I mean, we could just change right now. Just cut all the segments. Just stop doing that. No, no, we shouldn't do that. We need to keep going oh, on. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I, I was going to say, I'm fine if we just cut everything. Just kill it. <laughs> canceled. Canceled. Trust your doctors. Canceled. So, what happens next? Oh, yeah, they finally break in. Gwen, they enact their um, method to deceive the people at the front desk, let them, you know, up into the elevators, because obviously, or not obviously, but apparently, FICOR doesn't let you just roam their corporate offices. Yeah, amazing. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Though apparently you can just get up the stairs... I guess they figured that, like, the important stuff is so high up that, like, nobody would be, nobody would have the desire to, like, go up many dozens upon dozens of flights of stairs. And they were right. Maybe. Maybe he, maybe Rex just snuck in in the confusion. Maybe, yeah. So Gwen gets up to the, uh, the floor, they break in, everything's going according to plan, until it doesn't. Until the hitman from the beginning of the episode shows up. Yeah, and the timing on this is so f is is hilarious because Esther calls uh, CPS to find out what happened with her uh, sister. Yeah, she picks now of all times to do it, not the like downtime they probably had before they started doing this. Yep. <laughs> yep. And they basically they tell her like we took the uh, we took the kids away. And and committed your sister to, or not your sister, because she doesn't tell them who it is, but they, she says they committed, the person on the phone says they committed uh, the mom to a mental institution. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And Esther's like, wait, what? <laughs> She's like, what did you expect to happen, <laughs> Esther? Like, yeah, what was not like? I'm, this is going to sound like I'm joking, but what actually was her? What did what did she want to accomplish by calling CPS? You know. No, I mean, yeah, I'm not even joking when I say like, what did she expect? Because honestly, what did she expect? Yeah, I mean, I've heard those CPS jokes online, right? Of like, it's kind of a meme where it's like, you know, if the kid has water, then they're not going to take him away. Like, <laughs> yeah. Also, that was the other thing. CPS moving faster in this episode than they ever have in real life. Yeah. <laughs> same the same day, taking the kids away from the mom on one call. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, I mean, I just, I just, I don't know what Esther even thought would happen. But basically, Rex is like, what is that? And he's like, oh, CPS just took my sister's kids. And he's like, did you visit your sister? She's like, yes. And she's like, why would you do that? And then literally at that exact moment, the hitman just like strangles Gwen. (laughs) Rex is like, this could lead to, and then (laughs) you just cut. (laughs) This could lead to major issues, Esther, to which Esther responds by going, oh no, I've lost contact with the contact lenses. We only lose contact if the person wearing them is unconscious. (laughs) We only lose contact when there are major issues. <laughs> so then like the next time Esther sees so Jack realizes Gwen is in trouble because uh, she's not responding to his his calls so he runs basically through the the building and then the next time Esther sees anything is when Gwen like opens her eyes to see Jack being like are you okay and just this ominous shot of the hitman behind Jack right. so Jack and Gwen get Basically bound and gagged. Not actually gagged, though, because the hitman needs to, uh, um, you know, uh, gesticulate his plan. That's absolutely not the word I'm looking for, but it was the only one that was coming to mind. He needs to villain speech the hell out of them, basically. Yeah. Rex, meanwhile, is, takes matters into his own hands. He decides to run up 66 flights of stairs to get to the 33rd floor so he can deal with the situation himself. Mm-hmm. Which he does bleeding out. Jack and Gwen sort of... They do this pretty expertly. They sort of entice the information out of the hitman and are about to find out who he's working for, actually, when Rex shows up and just shoots him. Yeah, and, like, this is one of those scenes where Gwen is, in my opinion, completely, like, unnecessarily angry because she's like what the hell we were about to find out you know what was going on we were about to find out everything we needed to and i'm like he was about to shoot you like let's be honest here he was he was gonna shoot you yeah freaking leave it to gwen leave it to gwen all i can say (laughs) just continuing the exact thing that you were talking about criticizing like 10 minutes ago not exactly about how we're unnecessarily harsh exactly I don't even think we've been unnecessarily harsh, in all honesty. I think we've been perfectly in line with what they deserve. <laughs> Whoa, that's a bit, that might be a bit harsh, actually. <laughs> One thing the hitman does reveal before he, well, not dies, because he's not dead, before he gets his brain blasted out, is I think he says something along the lines of, like, he's been he and the people he's working for have been searching the world for a specific geography, which is an interesting line. Yes. Because before yeah. this, we had thought it was all about, obviously, making profit off of the drugs that FICOR was selling and was going to be able to sell now that the miracle is, has happened. But this is adding a, a new element to it, I think. He also says something about how the fact that he's been sent you to kill Jack and how the miracle happening means that they found what they were looking for. Right. Which, you know, you can go anywhere you want with that. It just opens the rabbit hole of, like, what is actually happening here? To me, I don't have a concrete conclusion from this or a con- concrete theory, but it seems obvious now, given what he said, that, like, they enacted the miracle, that, like, maybe the prophets weren't the ultimate goal. Maybe that. Maybe there's just a, a happy coincidence, right? Maybe their ultimate goal is is greater, and maybe it has something to do with uh, making space available for some 
further plan or something. You know, they're obviously uh, cordoning people off into. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a. It's a. It's a confusing puzzle to put together. But um, maybe infrastructurally, they're they're in for some changes, or they're trying to enact change or something to create certain landscapes or create certain cityscapes that look mm-hmm. different than anything that would be possible for the miracle. I don't know. I don't know where they're going, but it's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of places that they could take this that I'm really curious to see what they're going to do with. Because just saying, like, they were looking for geography is such a, like, Da Vinci Code kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it actually is. (laughs) It's such a, like, Holy Grail actually means the bloodline kind of (laughs) clue. It could mean anything, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, uh, while Danes went into the hospital... Monroe has been kidnapped uh, and is now she's tied up in her car and there's a video on the screen basically telling her like the families will not tolerate you like you know the things we actually kind of agree with some of the things you were saying but we've already got Oswald and you were kind of just getting in the way right so we definitely see like a larger power kind of playing both sides in this Mm mm-hmm she Monroe gets her own Final Destination esque moment where she gets like crushed in a um, uh, what do you call them? Um, not a trash compactor. A uh, oh shoot, yeah, shoot. Oh my god, what are you? Uh, yeah, god, I, what are they <laughs> I don't know. It's like a car crusher. Yeah, that's what I just. Oh my god, is that what you googled? Car to... crusher. It is a car crusher. Oh, okay, neat. Yeah, an, an industrial device used to reduce the dimensions of derelict cars. Huh, nice. Got it. <laughs> yeah, she gets final destination. <laughs> I guess it's not really a final destination esque death because it's only like there's only one part to it, right? It's not like you know, it's not like a multi layer, multi step death. Mm-hmm. But I haven't actually watched Final Destination. I've just watched some of the clips on YouTube or something. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Never seen Final Destination, but I've read the Wikipedia plot summaries, which is basically the same thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but... <laughs> <laughs> the episode ends with a call from Reese telling Gwen that her dad is being taken to an overflow camp, and Reese falls for the propaganda of it. He's like, yeah, he's being taken to this great camp, and they're gonna, you know, have a great time. And Gwen is like, oh my god, no! No! And I was like, no, not Geraint! <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Geraint! Oh, no. He might... Oh, no. Yeah, so who knows if Geraint's gonna make it through the season. They've been heavily foreshadowing something bad happening with him. We talked about last week um, Esther, perhaps being averse to the end of the miracle because of her sister, but now it seems like that role might be thrust upon Gwen by the end of this with her dad. Yeah, wouldn't it just suck if her dad just, like, just, they end the miracle and her dad just eats it? Yeah, it's, I, I think that's going to happen. <laughs> if Torchwood ends by killing Geraint, then they deserve to not have a fifth season. <laughs> well, this is completely unrelated but I did have like the death of a major character in the final episode of the season just spoiled for me uh, in just a random, completely unrelated like Reddit thread that like wasn't even related to season four of Torchwood at all. So wow. great. Well, well, Rex, like presumably they're going to stop miracle at the end, which obviously means that Rex is going to die. So uh, yeah, if that's, if that's what Maybe. you spoiled, then that's like not really a surprise. Well, I mean, I can't tell you what I spoiled because then I would spoil it for you too. And I don't want to do that to you. Okay. For some reason. Okay. <laughs> wow. Thanks for adding that bit at the end there. <laughs> Just for you. I got you. <laughs> well, just because I know that, uh, you know, you don't really care about spoilers, really, normally. Yeah. I don't, so you're, you're right in that not giving the spoiler is equal to to revealing it, because I just don't really care. 
Well, anyway, <laughs> let's move away from this conversation. To and into our segments, I guess. The only thing I wanted to talk about here was Nicholas Frumpkin, which I already touched on. Yeah, I didn't have much to talk about except that, like, just Russell T doing greatest hits of Russell T next season. Um, I mean, next episode, sorry, because it looks like he's going to do the episode five Children of Earth videotape message again, I guess. Mm. Um, I did, I guess, in that Reddit thread, actually learn the one that spoiled. Anyway, uh, I did learn in that thread that seasons three and four are more directly Russell T seasons than Chris Chibnall seasons, whereas seasons one and two are the like Chris Chibnall seasons that Russell T really takes over for season three and four Hmm. uh, in a much more direct creative capacity than, uh, than he was in the first two seasons where it really was more of Chris Chibnall's beast. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this a lot at the end of series two was like a lot of those were, a lot of the the overall feel of those, I guess you could say, and even some plot points were are directly now in series, you know, eleven and twelve. Yeah. Now that Chris Chibnall has control of the main program, the main star, and, and basically the only one left since all the spinoffs are dead. <laughs> yeah, they keep dying. <laughs> they keep killing the spinoffs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean that's all i really wanted to, to actually talk about this episode was you know didn't really provide a lot of things to to talk about it feels more of a setup episode you know setting up we get the servers in this episode but we don't really know what's on them and we probably won't until next episode so and that's i think what's going to be What's really to talk about? The only thing that gets briefly mentioned that they figured out is the overflow camps mm-hmm. that Flycore is uh, apparently has a hand in setting up. Yep. And that's where Geraint is going. So, and it looks like we're going back to Wales for next week, based on the preview. So, just really flying around the world this season. Right, right. It's a shame we couldn't have stayed in in uh in LA longer. In Venice Beach. Although I do remember looking up like LA list of appearances on the TARDIS wiki last week and it looks like it does have more than one appearance in this season. I yeah, don't exactly I, remember, but wouldn't be surprised if we come back here since well Ficor HQ is here, so mm-hmm. I guess that leads us into our segments. Yep. So uh, I wonder which one we should start with this week. Maybe the uh, British isms, you know, give that its time in the sun since it's uh, since it's new. Yeah, why not? I didn't really have any. I just had um, the obviously not Californian license plates, which you wouldn't know if you weren't from California. But if you were, like, you can <laughs> see that the cars in this don't have California license plates, or if they do, they're the heavily stylized ones that most people don't have. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I had to talk about was the one thing they get right, which is the like massive time difference between here and the UK when when Reese is calling and they're not doing some nonsense. It's always midday when everyone's on screen kind of thing. But otherwise, I didn't really uh, pick up on anything. Yeah, not giving us a lot to work with, whereas last episode just kind of, you know. Last kept, episode you know, took all of them from underhand us. at us, yeah. I guess, by just dumping them all into one episode. Curses. Yeah. Damn. Uh, how is this going to affect Gwen? Or Jack? <laughs> Wait, Gwen. I, I was thinking of the seven deadly sins of Gwen and Jack segments at the same time. So I mashed them together in my mind. No, how is this going to affect Jack? My bad. Not that much, I guess. It wasn't really about him. Yeah. He's been through worse. Yeah, I mean, the only real thing he does is uh, save Gwen in this episode. Like, that's his main contribution to the plot. Yeah. Except for Rex's, like, another weirdly, like, almost anti-gay joke where uh, Rex is like, do you turn everyone gay? To Jack. 
Yeah, what he had like a snarky he response says, to that, but I don't remember what it was. Uh. <laughs> so, I mean, that's maybe where they're going with this is that like Rex is in the closet or something, and like that's why his dad doesn't want to stay with him. That would be a wild like, he was plot one... thread. That would be wild. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen, you're right, but I mean, it, it lines up. He was the one who started making those gay jokes on the it's plane, true. so it kind of lines up there. That's true. <clears throat> I hadn't thought about that. But yeah. S- still, that would be that would be a wild direction to uh, take it in. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> no. No. Sorry. As for Gwen, though, I don't really know about this episode. I mean, what she commits, I guess, wrath. She gets mad that her dad, she, she, maybe it's not even anger. She just gets very flustered at the end, obviously, because her dad is being taken away. Oh, I had wrath, but for when, like, for when Rex saves her and Jack and she just yells at Rex for, like, 30 seconds straight. Yeah, true. That was the only one that I had, though, was wrath. I didn't, I didn't have any others. Yeah, this is the only one yeah. I had as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh well. Sometimes it's just that's just how the cookie crumbles. Sometimes Gwen is just a good person, and we should applaud those moments. You did it, Gwen. But also look forward to when she falls back into depravity. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> Anyway, this episode had a couple new characters. Yes, it did. That I, that I neglected to look up. It's all me this week. It's all me. So, we've got Mayor Winningham, who plays Ellis Hartley Monroe. Uh, she's been in a couple things The Affair, The Seagull, American Horror Story, Hawaii 5 0, Mirror Mirror 24, Grey's Anatomy, ER, uh, St. Elmo's Fire. It's a big movie from the 80s. And then we've also got C. Thomas Howell as, I think IMDb credits him as the gentleman, but he's the uh, the assassin who's trailing Gwen and Jack the whole episode. His biggest role was in Walking Dead, but he's also been in Criminal Minds, Bosch, The Punisher, Hawaii Five-0, Alphas, Psych, 24, ER, E.T., and a, and a TV movie called The Poseidon Adventure, which is <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, so a lot of uh, just big American shows there for both of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which isn't a surprise because, again, co-production with stars. Yeah, really roping in some of these big American TV stars. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah, that wasn't even clever. (laughs) No. (laughs) But anyway. And that's all I have to talk about this week because uh, I have no emails, actually. Yeah, I don't think we got any comments on the social media accounts, so... Curses. <laughs> Curses. Foiled again. Yeah, I guess. Well, on that note then, if you'd like to email us, you can read us at the doctordecadavestable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters. Your thoughts on Escape to L.A., Escape from L.A. You can find us on YouTube at Decade of Vegetable. That's on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and anywhere you find the podcast at Trust Your Doctor. Be sure to leave rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. Next time we're going to be watching the categories of life. But until then, the end. <laughs> <laughs>